All right, so this morning, we are going to continue this morning and this evening in uh, the same kind of series I've been doing. And basically, the, the point of the series is understand who God is. So a lot of the sermons I've been preaching here, just in general, a lot of the sermons uh, you hear have more to do with, you know, what we need to do as Christians with, with um, you know, in regards to sin, in regards to doing good, in regards to other things. But lately we've been studying on who, just on who God is. And I've been going through the various characteristics of God to understand our Creator, understand our God, and just to get to know Him better. And the more we know Him, that's going to help us to know more what we should be doing and how we should be living and, and things like that. So I've, got, I've covered many characteristics in the past few weeks. And this morning, what we'll be focusing on, I'm actually combined three different characteristics. So I'm going to try to get through them. And actually, these ones I'm calling attributes. I discussed that before. It, you know, it may just be semantics, but characteristics are part of God's character, right? Kind of what makes up who, who God is as far as maybe a personality goes versus what I'm covering this morning are more attributes that these are just things that are true about God that don't necessarily influence his character. It's just part of who God is. And what I mean by that is the three the subjects I'm covering are one is that God is eternal. Right? That has nothing to do with, with how God operates. It just, it just is. It is what it is. God is eternal. God is from everlasting and to everlasting. There is no uh, stopping. There's no death. There's no birth. There's no beginning. There's no end. God is that he is. And that is an attribute of God. Another attribute of God is that he's omnipresent, which means he is everywhere. He's not just in one physical location, but that God exists everywhere. And then the third one is that God is omnipotent, which means he's all powerful. So these are three attributes of God that just are, are what God is. God contains these attributes and um, these are different from every other creature, creation, anything like that. These only belong to God. So let's dig in here. We started in Isaiah 43. You can stay there because we're going we're gonna to look at a couple passages in Isaiah. I'm just going to read a couple of other passages for you. Deuteronomy 33, 27, the Bible says, The eternal God is thy refuge, and underneath are the everlasting arms. And he shall thrust out the enemy from before thee and shall say, destroy them. So the Bible says in Deuteronomy 33, 27, the eternal God. God is eternal. God is forever. Hebrews 7, another famous passage about Melchizedek. Melchizedek is, uh, I believe, a reference here to Jesus Christ himself. But the Bible talks about Melchizedek, who, whom we see appear in the Old Testament. In Hebrews chapter 7, I'll read this for you. The Bible reads in verse number 1, for this Melchizedek, king of Salem, priest of the Most High God, who met Abraham returning from the slaughter of the kings and blessed him, to whom also Abraham gave a tenth part of all, first being by interpretation king of righteousness, and after that also king of Salem, which is king of peace, without father, without mother, without descent, having neither beginning of days nor end of life, but made like unto the Son of God, abideth a priest continually. In that one verse alone, Hebrews 7, 3, is why I believe that Melchizedek is an Old Testament appearance of Jesus Christ. Because that right there says that Melchizedek was without father and without mother. No human being on earth is without father and without mother. The only one that's without father, without mother is God. And we believe that Jesus Christ is God. Jesus Christ was God in the flesh. That God literally came to this earth in the form of Jesus Christ, in the form of a man. And Jesus Christ, while he had an earthly mother that was the vessel chosen to give birth to him, it's not that we don't believe that like God was born. Right? We're like Jesus, like Jesus just came into existence at his birth or at his conception on this earth. That's how he was brought into this world, but Jesus existed in eternity past. And that's what we see here. You know, Melchizedek was without father, without mother, without descent, having neither beginning of days nor end of life, 
but made like unto the Son of God. He's saying this is exactly like the Son of God because he was an appearance of the Son of God. Jesus Christ, all, all these things, he says made like unto the Son of God, this is all descriptive of Jesus Christ. Without father, without mother, neither beginning of days nor end of life, Jesus is eternal. Now we started off in Isaiah chapter 43. And look, this is real basic and this is one of the reasons why I'm, I'm kind of combining some different attributes of God into one sermon because I'm not going to spend tons of time on this. I think this is pretty basic, pretty elementary, but it does need to be brought up. Uh, one reason it needs to be brought up is just for the fact that there are false religions out there and there's cults out there that deny the deity of Jesus Christ. And even just seeing verses like this, we need to have this reaffirmed so that you don't get screwed up by some false prophet out there trying to tell you, oh, Jesus Christ is just a created being. Jesus Christ is just Michael the Archangel. Jesus Christ is not God in the flesh. When we see verses like this, we understand uh, who God is, but specifically in Hebrews chapter 7, that Jesus Christ himself is, you know, this demonstrates the deity of Jesus Christ and that God is eternal. God has no beginning and no ending. Isaiah 43, look at verse number 10. Isaiah 43 is where we started. Look at verse number 10. The Bible reads, Ye are my witnesses, saith the Lord, and my servants whom I have chosen, that ye may know and believe me and understand that I am he. Before me there was no God formed, neither shall there be after me. So he's saying there has never been any other God. There is one God. No matter how far back you go, because God is eternal, there is, there's never been another God. It's not like God is our current God in a succession of gods. He's like, there's never been any other God. And you know what? There's not going to be any other gods in the future. He's saying, you can know this and trust this for sure, that I am God and that there's never been any other. There's never going to be any other. So you just worry about the one God, the Lord, that you need to worship and you need to look to. It's not different for different time periods. It's not different for anything else. You just, he says, like, I am the Lord. Thus saith the Lord. There is one God and he is eternal. There's never been any other gods. And again, you say, well, who would believe there's other gods? How about the Mormons? Which have been, I don't know. It seems like they've been gaining just popularity in general. I don't know. Or at least either that or they've been somewhat successful in not being perceived as cultish as they actually are and cultish in, the, in that they follow a man they follow the teachings of a man they don't believe the bible they don't believe jesus christ is the son of god they don't believe he's god in the flesh that's for sure and they do believe in multiple gods maybe you didn't know that before but the mormons believe that there are multiple gods and that a good mormon one day will be a god of their own planet that that's what they believe. And if you don't believe me, look up. Now, here's they won't they don't want to talk about that. When they're out riding on their bikes and, and you know, knocking on a door and you've got the 13 year old elder, you know, that, that goes off on their mission trips. They don't want to tell you that they believe in multiple gods. And I've had so many of them because I, I used to live in Arizona. And there's a lot of Mormons out there. I don't I haven't seen very many as, as much out here. They're not as big out here, but out west they're. There, there's a lot of them, and um, I've had some of them lie to me flat out before finally admitting, oh, yeah, we do actually believe that. Because they're like, what do you mean? We don't believe that. And you're like, no, you do. You do. And when you press them on it, you show you actually know what, what their doctrine teaches, then they'll be like, yeah, you know, it's like they try to hide it. They try to use guile and, and be deceptive. because Why? Because they want to be accepted by all of Christianity. And Christianity at large doesn't accept that you're going to be God of your own planet one day. And that there's just multiple gods. Because the only gods that Christianity believes in, that there's other gods, there are devils. Anything that's called God that's not the Lord, that's not Jesus Christ, is a devil. And that's why... Mormonism is a Luciferian religion. It's a devil religion because they believe in these devils and that they'll be a devil one day themselves. But let's keep reading here in Isaiah 43. Look at verse number 11. I, even I am the Lord, and beside me there is no Savior. 
I have declared and have saved, and I have showed when there was no strange God among you. Therefore, ye are my witnesses, saith the Lord, that I am God. Yea, before the day was, I am he. And there is none that can deliver out of my hand. I will work, and who shall let it? He's saying, before the day was, I am he. See, God is the one who created time, just our existence. God created everything, all matter, everything that exists physically that we know and spiritually and just everything, all things in heaven and in earth. God is the creator and the progenitor of everything. And that includes time. See, we understand everything in the concept of time because we're kind of stuck in this system of time. It's really hard to kind of allow your mind to grasp this concept of eternity. We understand everything in terms of time. We have beginnings and ends, births, deaths, right? Every, we're, we're in time right now. I mean, we're good. You think about what you did yesterday, what you're going to do tomorrow, it's all in a matter of time. But see, God is completely outside of that, which is why he's able to know the beginning from the end and just knows everything because he's not constrained in time. We don't know what the future holds, but God does. But that's getting into omniscience, and that is this evening's sermon. So omniscience is God knowing everything. But they're all related. They all kind of tie in together. When you understand that God is eternal, God is outside of time, God is never going to have an end. He's never had a beginning. He just is. And that's why when he presented himself to Moses, when, he, when Moses you know, was speaking to God in the burning bush, he said, who, who should I say sent me? Who, you know, who should I say you are? He said, I am that I am. Because ultimately, that's a, that's a really good description of God is just, I am. Just, just he is. God is. God is. God exists. God has always existed. There's never been a beginning. There's never going to be an end. I am. As so he says, before the day, so before there's any day, before any day, before the day, I am he. Amen. The beginning. That's why he says, I am the beginning and the end. I am all things, you know, because ultimately there is going to be an end of the world as we know it. And then a new beginning. But see, God is the creator of all of that. And this is, this also points to the problem that atheists have. Where did everything come from? Because they want to believe there's no God. Generation starting point. Where does it all start? See, they want to say we believe in some fairy tale and, and just made up thing. And oh, they don't want to accept that God is eternal and God always has been. But then where has everything come from? You say, oh, well, it came from the Big Bang. Well, where did that come from? What caused the Big Bang? What was in that tiny dot that was so small, was infinitesimally small, and, and they want to give you all this jargon and nonsense that everything came from nothing? Where, how? Where did that come from? How could you have everything come from nothing without some other being starting it? You can't. It just doesn't make any sense. But the fact that there is a God, that makes sense. It's really the only, the only thing that makes sense at all in our physical world is that there is another being that is outside of the system is able to create everything and give it a starting point. And that is God. Because God is eternal. In Isaiah 44, verse 6, the Bible reads, Thus saith the Lord, the King of Israel, and his Redeemer, the Lord of hosts, I am the first and I am the last, and beside me there is no God. And who is I shall call and shall declare it and set it in order for me, since I appointed the ancient people and the things that are coming and shall come, let them show unto them. So uh, Isaiah 43, 44, 45 really give us a lot of information on God. We're going to go back to that a little bit later if you want to keep a bookmark there. Um, we're going to go back into Isaiah 44. But for now, if you want to keep a bookmark, that's fine. But turn to... Um, 2 Chronicles chapter number 2. That's the eternality of God. God has always existed. He always will exist. Now I'm going to go to the omnipresence of God. The fact that God is everywhere. God exists everywhere. God, another way of putting this is God cannot be contained. Now, it's easy for us, and God often communicates with us in ways that, that we could understand and that are also not false. 
But in order for God to be able to communicate with us, to, for us to, to have any relation with God in a, in, a, in a meaningful sense, or at least in the sense that God wanted it to, to be, you know, we read things of God, of God sitting on the throne and Jesus Christ sitting on the throne and we see, you know, and, and having some physical traits and we know that we're made in the image of God. These are all completely truthful things, but at the same time, the Bible says that God is a spirit. And we only have so much comprehension with our limited minds to understand who God is. So as you're thinking about this, and, and you know, I, I was doing the same thing. Well, how can God be everywhere? Because we see some other descriptions of God where he has physical characteristics, or at least would see it appear to us. And my belief is just that that's more for our, but it is who God is, but I think it has more to do for maybe our benefit of the creation to, to be able to deal with God, communicate with God, and for him to deal with us in a way that's going to resonate with us. But the fact of the matter is that God is everywhere, and we're going to be able to see that just from Scripture. Right? I'm trying to prove everything from the Bible, because you hear these words, you know, this is, this is long held by even non-Christians. We kind of try to put a definition to God. The, the three most common attributes that come up are his omnipresence, his omnipotence, and his omniscience. All three of those things are, are kind of used very frequently to describe who God is, just God in general. But that does describe the God of the Bible. And we're going to see that in Scripture. So you're in 2 Chronicles chapter 2, look at verse number 4. This is where Solomon was talking about the temple and building a temple for God, you know, a house for the Lord. Look at verse number 4, the Bible reads, Behold, I build a house to the name of the Lord my God to dedicate it to him and to burn before him sweet incense and for the continual showbread and for the burnt offerings morning and evening on the Sabbaths and on the new moons and on the solemn feasts of the Lord our God. This is an ordinance forever to Israel. And the house which I build is great, for great is our God above all gods. Louis says in verse 6, but who is able to build him a house? He said, God is great. God is above all God. God is just, just huge. He's great. But who's able to build him a house, seeing the heaven and heaven of heavens cannot contain him? That God can't be contained even by, because think about it, if God created a space, if God created heaven, how is that going to be able to contain him? God is bigger than everything he created. He says that can't contain him. Who am I then that I should build him a house save only to burn sacrifice before him? So he's explaining because, you know, he built this temple. It's supposed to be the house of the Lord and it's a holy place and everything else. But it, he's still recognizing you know, even though we built this house, the point is really just to be able to burn sacrifices and have a place where we can do these things and, and offer up God these burnt sacrifices and offerings because ultimately God is not going to be just completely contained just in that little space. God doesn't need a house. You know, God doesn't need anything from us. God is the one who gives everything. He gives life. He's created everything. He doesn't need that from us. And the heaven, even the heaven of heavens, cannot contain him. Um, turn, if you would, please, to Psalm 193. Or, excuse me, Psalm 139, not 193. Getting dyslexic this morning. Psalm 139. I'm going to read for you from Jeremiah 23. Jeremiah 23, verse 23, the Bible reads, Am I a God at hand, saith the Lord, and not a God afar off? So he's saying, am I just a God that's just like at hand, meaning like real close right here, but not a God that's also far off and far away and could see from afar? Verse 24 says, can any hide himself in secret places that I shall not see him? So can anybody just find a hiding place anywhere and I'm not going to be able to see him? I'm not going to be able to know where he is. Said the Lord says, do not I fill heaven and earth, saith the Lord. So God's saying, I fill heaven and earth. How can you go anywhere and be away from God? He fills heaven and earth. 
God is everywhere. You can't hide from God. And people who foolishly want to try to get away from the presence of God, you can't. You can't do it. Just like jo uh, Jonah. You know, Jonah was told to do so. He was told to go preach in Nineveh. And what did he do? He tried to flee. He tried to get away from God. Well, what a foolish thing to do. He's on a boat in the middle of the, of the sea. And guess what? God was there. <laughs> it doesn't matter. He go in the opposite direction where he's supposed to be going, but God was still there. You cannot get away from God. And you know, this also debunks this false teaching that hell is separation from God. Right. Hell is not separation from God. Because do you know, do you know what the Bible says about people who are in hell that are suffering and being tortured and tormented? The Bible says it's in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb in the book of Revelation. Is that God is actually there. God is the one pouring out His wrath and His fury in hell right now on souls that are burning and, and tortured there. The only degree of separation that I accept when he's saying hell is separation from God is that they're separated in any type of good relationship with God. That's true because they're at the receiving end of his wrath and fury. But it's not like they're physically separated from God at all because no one is. And, and see, this is, this is the nonsense that people who want to tone down hell and twist and pervert the truth of God, the truth of the Bible, what the Bible actually says, that want to make you know, some parts of the Bible seem not so bad. And why do they do that? Because then they could get more people and get more people putting money in the offering plate because they're not offending anybody. Because the fact of the matter is, some pe there's a lot of people out there that don't want to hear about hell. They don't want to know about it. They'd rather bury their heads in the sand than be told the truth or hear the truth that there is a place of eternal judgment and, and torture and torment and some people don't want to believe that there is a God that would do such a thing. But my friends, the fact of the matter is he's real. And that is what the Bible describes about him, that there is a place called hell. It's a real place. And there's a God that created that place that's going to be sending people to hell, which is the whole reason why we go out and preach the gospel of Jesus Christ. It's the whole reason why Jesus Christ came to this earth and shed his blood and died on the cross and rose again from the dead was to pay for our sins so that we don't have to go to that place. That is why. It's the whole point. Because it's real. It's not just separation from God. The people try to tell you that, oh, see, it's just like torture to be separated from God and God's way over there and you're way over here and, and you just wish and yearn and long that you could be with God and that is hell. That's a bunch of nonsense. That foolishness would tell you that the people who on this earth want to have nothing to do with God, that somehow that's hell for them to then be separated from God, who they want to be separated from right now. To them, that's heaven. Yep. To have no rules, to have no authority, to have nobody to answer to, that's heaven for them. That's not hell. No, hell is a real place. And the people that don't want to have anything to do with God, they're going to go there. <laughs> Psalm 139, I had you turn there, right? This is going to show you that, again, that hell is not just is not separation from God and that nobody can go anywhere to get away from the presence of God. Look at verse number seven. The Bible reads in Psalm 139, verse number seven, whither shall I go from thy spirit or whither shall I flee from thy presence? If I ascend up into heaven, thou art there. Look at this. If I make my bed in hell, behold, thou art there there. He's saying, where am I going to go? Where is there I could go to get away from God? Well, if I go up to heaven, God's there. If I make my bed in hell, well, hey, guess what? God's there too. So where does this teaching come from that people say, well, God, hell is just separation from God? It comes from people who apparently don't read their Bible or people that want to deceive people who don't read their Bible. This is why it's so important. You need to be reading your Bible every single day. 
This is why I was going through the announcements today. It's so easy to talk about reading the Bible. We have a Bible reading challenge come up in January, reading the whole New Testament month of January. Why? Because you need to know the Word of God for yourself without relying on people to spoon feed it to you. Read it. Know it. Understand it. Love it. And don't let anybody stand up, stand behind the pulpit, stand on TV, wherever, and, and, and be deceived by their lies. It's a lot harder to be deceived by lies when you can read the Bible for yourself. I mean, it's, it's flat out right here. When I hear someone saying, oh, hell is just separation from God, I go, wait a minute. And the more you read the Bible, the more you're going to be remembering these verses. Going, no, 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 wait, I thought, I thought I remember a verse that said, Behold, if I make my bed in hell, behold, thou art there. I seem to remember something like that. Verse number nine, If I take the wings of the morning and dwell in the uttermost parts of the sea, even there shall thy hand lead me, and thy right hand shall hold me. If I say, Surely the darkness shall cover me, even the night shall be light about me, yea, the darkness hideth not from thee. But the night shineth as the day. The darkness and the light are both alike to thee. He's saying, even the darkness. You can't hide in the darkness. You can't do these secret things. And people think they can do these secret sins. And, and do things in dark. And wait till night. No one can see me. No one's going to know what I can do. And I'm all alone. I've locked myself in the house. And no one can see what I'm doing on the internet. You know who can? God. You know why? Because he's everywhere. And he knows everything. And there is no getting away and hiding from God no matter where you are, no matter what you do, no matter how much of a big of a vault you build and lock yourself in, and you can't get away from God. You cannot. Because he is everywhere. Verse 13 for thou hast possessed my reins, thou hast covered me in my mother's womb. I will praise thee, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Marvelous are thy works, and that my soul knoweth right well. Let's see here. Acts now. Turn, if you would, please, to John chapter 3. I'll read Acts 17 for you. I'm running a little bit long on my time because omnipotence is a really big, important point that I don't want to um, not have enough time for. In Acts chapter 17, we've got the Apostle Paul speaking to the people in Athens. And they have all these altars, all these false gods, and they had all this paganism going on and multiple gods and everything else. So he's trying to explain who the true God really is to them. And in his explanation, I'll just read this for you in Acts 17, verse 24. You're turning to John chapter 3. Acts 17, 24, the Bible reads, God that made the world and all things therein, seeing that he is Lord of heaven and earth, dwelleth not in temples made with hands, neither is worshipped with men's hands, as though he needed anything, seeing he giveth to all life and breath and all things. So he's just explaining his real basic principles of God. Because these gods that they had, they're relying on for all these different things and these gods help each other out and this God fails at this thing and that God, you know, steps in and it was just utter nonsense. And he's just trying to explain, you know, God made everything. He doesn't need these temples. He doesn't need you to do anything for him. He doesn't need anyone else to do anything for him. God created everything and he's Lord of all. He says, and hath made of one blood all nations of men for to dwell on all the face of the earth. There isn't a God of this people and a God of that people. He said, God's made everybody. God's made all the nations of one blood. So it doesn't matter if you're from Greece. It doesn't matter if I'm from Saudi Arabia and he's from Africa and he's from, you know, wherever. It doesn't matter because God has made all of the nations of one blood. God's made everybody of one blood. And hath determined the times before appointed and the bounds of their habitation that they should seek the Lord, if haply they might feel after him and find him, though he be not far from every one of us. So no matter where you are or what you're doing, he's like, the Bible saying, God's not far from anybody. Why? Because God is everywhere. For in him we live and move and have our being, as certain also of your own poets have said, for we are also his offspring. I do turn to John chapter 3. And that's just the Apostle Paul just giving some real basic truths about who God is. John chapter 3, 
very powerful verse, verse number 13. This is Jesus Christ himself speaking. And of course, every time we go over different characteristics or attributes of God, I like to show how Jesus possesses the same attributes. Just to further exemplify what we believe about God and that Jesus is God. And Jesus is part of the triune God, the Father, the Son, the Holy Ghost. These three are one. We believe that doctrine here and uh, it is taught all throughout Scripture. John 3.13, the Bible says, And no man hath ascended up to heaven, but he that came down from heaven, even the Son of Man, which is in heaven. John chapter 3 this is history for us, that this event already happened. But this event is recording what Jesus Christ said when he was on this earth. These are the words of Jesus Christ. So as Jesus Christ is speaking these words to Nicodemus, what he's saying, he says, No man hath ascended up to heaven, but he that came down from heaven, which is referring to himself. Jesus came down from heaven. And he's referring, this is one point, first of all, that's interesting, He's already referring to his ascension as if it already happened. And it hadn't happened in time yet, right? We're bound by time. In Jesus' mind, it's already happened. Because in a sense, it has. Because for God, who's outside of time, it's all happened and it all hasn't happened. It doesn't, it doesn't matter. There is no time. At the, simultaneously, at the same time. Everything's already, been ha already happened and, and nothing has yet for God because it's all just, he's standing outside. It's like if you look at a video that's already been recorded, you can see the timeline. You could jump here, you could jump there. Could, that's kind of one way of thinking about how God is just with the whole world and everything that we know. It's like one big video of just, it's, it's already happened, but you could jump at any point in time that you'd like to. So Jesus said, no man hath ascended up to heaven, but he that came down from heaven. But he hasn't yet. And look at this. Even more mind-blowing. Even the Son of Man. Who's the Son of Man? Jesus Christ. Who's speaking? Jesus Christ. Even the Son of Man, which is in heaven. Jesus Christ on this earth, speaking to Nicodemus, says the Son of Man, which is in heaven. He's saying he's in heaven while he's speaking to Nicodemus. God cannot be bound. Because Jesus Christ is God, he can't be bound. That's, why he was, that's also why he was able to say to the thief on the cross, this day shalt thou be with me in paradise. Not because hell is called paradise, as some people might try to teach, because the Bible says that Jesus' soul went to hell for three days and three nights before the resurrection. But the fact that the, the, the reason he was able to say that, he, that, that the thief on the cross was going to be with him in paradise is because Jesus is God and ultimately God is everywhere. God just, I mean, he was able to say this here, Son of Man which is in heaven. Now, we have to look at the Bible and just believe if what it says is true, regardless of, of the degree to which you can comprehend how that can be. Because there's some aspects, when we're trying to think about the characteristics or the attributes of God, there's some things that are just going to be really hard for us to fully 100% just comprehend. Even just thinking outside of time, it's difficult to, to really have a good understanding of what that's like. Because our entire existence is bound by time. And it's all we know, it's all we deal with. So trying to think outside of that paradigm is, is extremely difficult. Um, and then also, we, we just covered this this week in Matthew chapter 18, but I didn't really specifically touch on this point. If you're here for the Bible study, Matthew 18, verse 20, the Bible says, For where two or three are gathered together in my name, there am I in the midst of them. Jesus Christ, again, speaking in that verse, and he says, hey, when you've got two or three speaking in my name, in the name of Jesus Christ, he says, I'm right there in the midst. Again, another time where Jesus Christ is literally speaking, and he's saying he's there. And now think, how many people would be gathered together simultaneously in different locations in the name of Jesus? I mean, think about even just right now. Right now at, at 11.30 a.m. on a Sunday in Eastern Standard Time. 
How many people are gathered together in the name of Jesus Christ? Well, there, there he is in the midst. Guess what? Jesus is here right now. But he's not just here. He's gathered together with everyone that's gathered together in his name and has been for all eternity. Interesting truth. All right, now let's get into the omnipotence of God. Uh, turn, if you would, to... Turn, if you would, to Matthew chapter 28. And then we're going to go to Matthew 19. I'm going to read some verses for you. I'm going to try to do this as quickly as possible so we get out of here at a good time this morning. Omnipotence, meaning God is all powerful. God has power that, that is unlimited. There is no limit to God's power. There is, there's no measure. You know, we as human beings, we've got a limit. I've got a limit as to how much I can lift, as to how much I can bench, as how much I could do. How long I could endure, how long I could do anything before my body is going to fail. Right? God has no constraints at all. And there's nothing that is too hard for the Lord. Just think about God's name. He says, you know, the Lord Almighty. Almighty means all-powerful. How many times do you see that in the Bible? That was actually the name that God went by before Moses, before he gave him the name of Jehovah. He was known by the name of the Lord Almighty. That was his name. That was part of his name is just he's almighty, all-powerful. So we're talking about an attribute of God. Well, there's a very good one when he makes it part of his name. Genesis 17, 1 says, And when Abram was 90 years old and nine, the Lord appeared to Abram and said unto him, I am the Almighty God. Walk before me and be thou perfect. So he, as he addresses himself to Abram, I'm the Almighty God. There, you, know, you might have heard these other gods, I'm Almighty. There is no thing greater in power than God. He's Almighty. In Matthew 28, so where I had you turn, again, Jesus Christ sharing these attributes. Look at verse number 18, Matthew 28, 18. And Jesus came and spake unto them, saying, All power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. All power. Jesus saying, I have all power in heaven and in earth. It was given him of the Father. Um, you think about these phrases in, I'll read this for you. Turn, if you would, to Matthew 19. You're in Matthew 28. Just go backwards to Matthew chapter 19. The Bible says in multiple places, is anything too hard for the Lord? Is there anything that's too difficult, that's too hard? Is there, is there anything at all that God cannot do? No. Genesis 18, 14, the Bible reads, is anything too hard for the Lord? At the time appointed, I will return unto thee according to the time of life, and Sarah shall have a son. This is when Abraham and, and Sarah... You know, we're barren. Sarah was barren. She didn't have a child. But at 90 years old, God said she's going to give birth to a son. And we go, well, how could that happen? Well, is anything too hard for God? Yeah, for us, it's too hard. We, I mean, normally, no one at 90, no woman at 90 years old is going to give birth to a child. It's not going to happen. They're beyond the years of, of giving birth. But God was able to make it happen. Why? Because nothing is too hard for God. Jeremiah 32, 27, Bible reads, Behold, I am the Lord, the God of all flesh. Is there anything too hard for me? See, the fact that there are miracles recorded, miracles alone demonstrate God's power. He makes the impossible possible. Think about all the miracles, again, that Jesus Christ performed through the power of the Holy Ghost. And I'm not going to get into all of that. That's kind of a whole... Trinity sermon I could preach, but the fact that Jesus Christ healed people who were blind, who were deaf, in so much as he raised people back even from the dead. That is all power. Nothing was withheld from the power to be able to just do whatever in his environment. That's attribute, an attribute of God, which has been proven and demonstrated. That's why the Bible says, you know, God gets all this credit and praise and honor and glory for bringing the children of Israel out of Egypt. Because, why? Because he brought them out with a strong arm. How many times is that referred to? God wants us to know that he is all-powerful, that he is almighty. Why? So we don't need to fear anyone else, any other God, anything else at all. Because if God is all-powerful, what do we have to fear? 
other than God himself. And that is the only healthy fear that any person should ever have is a fear of the Lord. Fear God. Just fear not him which is able to uh, destroy your body. Right? Just fear him that's able to destroy both soul and body in hell. You know, people on this earth, they might be able to kill you. They could cause you to, to lose your life on this earth. But that's all they can do. That is the most that anyone can ever do over you. But God has power to destroy both soul and body in hell. And if God has that much power, God can also prevent people from taking life. God can stop the person who thinks that they have so much power and turn things on their head. And we're going to see that here in a little bit as well, what God does with, uh, with Nebuchadnezzar. We'll go to that story in a little bit on how he, show, he demonstrates, no, I'm really the one in charge here. You think you're so powerful. You think you've done all these things. No, actually, it's not you. You don't get the credit. You don't get the glory. You don't get the honor because it's God who is almighty. Matthew 19, verse 26. The Bible reads, But Jesus beheld them and said unto them, With men this is impossible, but with God all Things are possible. All things are possible. Why? Because God is almighty. God is all powerful. Men are not. God is. Uh, I had you, hopefully, you kept a place in Isaiah 44. Go back to Isaiah 44. I'm going to skip over this passage in Luke 8. There's this example, like so many in the New Testament, of all the miracles that Jesus performed. God is so powerful. You know, we think of power, we think of might. Think about some instance where you might experience some level of great power on a, on a high scale or high magnitude. And I think of things like natural disasters. You think of tornadoes, hurricanes, earthquakes. There's a lot of power and might behind these, these naturally occurring events. Right? If anyone's ever been, especially in the midst of anything like that, that can strike fear into your heart really quickly because there are forces involved that are 100% outside of your control that you can't really do anything about except pray to God that he'll keep you safe you know through these these major massive storms and an example in Luke chapter 8 you don't have to turn there I'm just going to I'm just going to summarize it when you know Jesus is on the boat with his disciples and there's this huge storm in the middle of this great tempest in the middle of the sea and Jesus is asleep. And people who are even experienced seamen, Peter, James, John, they're fishermen. They've been out on the sea. They've dealt with this stuff on a regular basis. They're starting to get scared and they're going like, Master, Master, we're going to die. This storm is so bad. We're going to die. We're going to perish. They were fearful because of all of this, this you know, power of the storm outside in the boat. And Jesus wakes up. What does he do? He rebukes the wind and, and just makes it go calm, just... So this great force in, in nature that we see, Jesus is able to squash it just without batting an eye. Why? Because he's all-powerful. Because God is almighty. And that even the, the, the most powerful things that we could imagine and think of are like nothing for God. And think about God as a creator. How, how, did, how did everything come to exist? Genesis 1 tells us, in the beginning, God said. Right? Day 1, God said, let there be light. God said, and it was so. God said, and it was so. God said, let the land appear. God said. That's all he had to do. How powerful is that? I mean, creating everything that exists just by speaking it into existence. That demonstrates, again, the, the all-powerful, almightiness of God. Isaiah 44 is where I do turn. Look at verse number 24. The Bible reads, Thus saith the Lord thy Redeemer, and he that formed thee from the womb. I am the Lord that maketh all things. So, right, I mean, just right off the bat, I'm going to stop kind of as we're reading through this because... There's so many even just little phrases that just go and speak volumes to the power of God. 
Thus saith the Lord, thy Redeemer, so he's the one who saves, and he that formed thee from the womb. God forms every human being, every person from the womb. God is the one forming and shaping and fashioning every child in every womb Amen. for every person who's ever been born. God is the one doing that. God's got his hand in the womb, yet wicked people today want to go in and cut out and kill what God is forming and fashioning in that womb and call it abortion and call it choice and say, oh no, my body, my choice. Not your body. It's God's body. That's God's person that he created in that womb. And who do you think you are going in and trying to kill that person? Who God has his hand forming and fashioning and shaping and, and forming inside the womb. That's right. Murderer. I am the Lord that maketh all things. All th is anything exempted from that? No. God makes all things. That stretcheth forth the heavens alone. That spreadeth abroad the earth by myself. This is what God's saying. He's like, I made all this stuff by myself. I didn't need anyone, anyone to help me with this. I created the earth. I created the heavens. Verse 25, that frustrateth the tokens of the liars. Deceptive people, people who are out there lying. He's like, I could confound or frustrate or just, just cause what they're trying to do to not work, to not happen, to not come to fruition. He's like, I could just destroy what they're doing. These liars. Um, he says, and maketh diviners mad. Mad is like crazy. Just, just these people who... Diviners are people who want to speak like in the name of the Lord, but they're not, they're not following the Lord. They're following after these false gods and stuff and, and trying to say that they are in touch with the divine. And he's able to just make their words come to nothing. It says, that turneth wise men backward and maketh their knowledge foolish. Again, speaking of the power of God. These people who seem to be so wise in this world, I could confound their wisdom and just make them look like fools. Because ultimately they are when you compare <laughs> their knowledge and wisdom to God. Verse 26, that confirmeth the word of his servant and performeth the counsel of his messengers that saith to Jerusalem, thou shalt be inhabited and to the cities of Judah ye shall be built. And I will raise up the decayed places thereof. So he's saying, I'm able to just say, you're going to be inhabited to a city. You're going to be built up. Cities have been destroyed. They've been wiped out where man's going to think, yeah, there's no way that this is ever going to come back. This is just raised to the ground. There is no hope for this city. God says, this could be inhabited. And he makes it happen. He calls, you say, but people are working. Yeah, but God is the one who is organizing and orchestrating it, that people will get it done. God is the one responsible for these things happening. Verse 27, that saith to the deep, be dry, and I will dry up thy rivers. So he's saying, I can just say to the deep, the ocean, these great seas, be dry. And just like there was no water there at all. That's why he was able to, to even just bring forth the children of Israel when they crossed the Red Sea. It says they went forth on dry ground. You think about how wet it is. I mean, even if you were to remove water from any lake or stream or anything, any river, you're going to have some really wet ground even after you remove that water for a really long time because it's just saturated in the ground. God just makes it dry. He's just able to go, we're going to make a path for you right through the middle of the sea and you're going to walk on dry ground. Verse 28, that saith of Cyrus, he is my shepherd and shall perform all my pleasure. Now this goes into God using kings or rulers to do his will. Why? Because he's all powerful. He's saying, you know what, Cyrus, he's my shepherd. I've put him in place and he's going to do what I want him to do. Even saying to Jerusalem, thou shalt be built and to the temple, thy foundation shall be laid. This is God referring to um, you know, the, the rebuilding of the temple after, after Israel's been taken captive and brought into Babylon. He's saying, you know what? 
yeah, it's been looking terrible. They were brought into bondage. They were brought into slavery. But I'm going to bring them back because I'm going to have somebody in charge that's going to allow them to go back and, and cause them to rebuild everything and give them the funding and give them everything that they need to get this done. That would normally be an impossible task. That even if the children of Israel were just set free, there's no way they're going to be able to rebuild Jerusalem and rebuild the temple and do all that stuff on their own. No, God worked through the heart of Cyrus to make sure they got everything that they needed. Why? Because God wanted it to be that way. Because it was God's will. So he made it happen. Uh, flip over to chapter 45. Look at verse number 5. And I'm going to get into, um, we always got to be real careful, especially in this, in this area. I'm going to get into this a little bit more tonight when I get into the knowledge and God being all, like knowing all things. But it, again, these things all work together. God being all powerful and God knowing all things all work together. And we could read a lot of passages because God's all powerful, He could do whatever He wants. But it's also important to recognize that God has given a, a will to man, and that because we see God intervening sometimes and God making things happen, where it's very clear that God does make things happen, and that's what God wanted to happen, that He'll make it happen. We can't go to the extreme of Calvinism that just says that everything in the whole world that happens, that's ever happened, is all a direct result that God wanted every single one of those things to happen and God made every single one of those things happen. Because that is also false. That is not true. God does intervene. God does step in sometimes, but God is not the author of every single thing that happens in the world and, and, and causes everything everything to happen. If he were, then there would be no such thing as a free will. No one would really have a choice if God caused everything to happen. So while God has the power and is almighty and can cause whatever to happen that he wants to to happen, he doesn't always use that power to make everything happen the way he wants to. I just want to be clear. About, I'm going to go a little bit more in depth in, on that subject tonight because, again, they're, they're kind of related with, with the knowledge and the, the foreordination and knowing the beginning from the end and things like that. But I really want to make sure I'm clear about that because that is an important point to understand. Because there are a lot of places we see the, the almighty power of God. And, God. and God does set up rulers and God does do things like this for, for what he wants to have happen and knowing the beginning from the end, but at the same time, he does not just, it's not just this continual superseding of any will that we have, because then we would just be like robots, and that's not what he created. Isaiah uh, 45, look at verse number five, the Bible reads, I am the Lord and there is none else. There is no God beside me. I girded thee, though thou hast not known me, that they may know from the rising of the sun and from the west that there is none beside me. I am the Lord and there is none else. I form the light and create darkness. I make peace and create evil. I, the Lord, do all these things. God is all powerful. I'll turn if you would to Daniel chapter 4. I'm gonna, this is, we're going to close on this. Daniel chapter 4. We're going to see an example of how God worked in the life of Nebuchadnezzar. And God brought him to power. But we're still going to see there is a will of Nebuchadnezzar. But then there's also correction from God as a result of what Nebuchadnezzar says and does. And in order for Nebuchadnezzar to understand and acknowledge God, who put him there, and I'll acknowledge God, who was able to put him in a position in order to do and bring judgment against people who God wanted him to do that. 
Daniel chapter 4 is where we're going to start here in verse number 30. Daniel chapter 4, verse number 30. Bible reads, The king spake. So this is King Nebuchadnezzar spake and said, Is not this great Babylon that I have built for the house of the kingdom by the might of my power and for the honor of my majesty? He's saying, look at all this. Isn't this this great empire that I have built because of my great power and my great might and my majesty? And he's lifted himself up in pride because God has delivered these people into his hand. Because God was bringing judgment upon those people. And God fought against many of those people in order to bring punishment and judgment upon them but here we have Nebuchadnezzar thinking that he is just the greatest. Look at me. Look how great I am. Verse 31, while the word was in the king's mouth. So he hasn't even completely finished his sentence. He's still just saying all this about how great he is. There fell a voice from heaven saying, O king Nebuchadnezzar, to thee it is spoken. The kingdom is departed from thee. So that's it. You blew it. I'm taking it away from you. And they shall drive thee from men, and thy dwelling shall be with the beasts of the field. They shall make thee to eat grass as oxen, and seven times shall pass over thee, until thou know that the Most High ruleth in the kingdom of men, and giveth it to whomsoever he will. He's saying, I'm going to make you like an animal. I'm going to turn you, your heart into like the heart of a beast. You're saying you're gonna be, he's going to be eating grass, he's going to be outside. It says seven times means for seven years. Seven whole years. He's going to be just turned into this animal. And he's like, until you understand <laughs> that, that I'm in charge and you better recognize that and I'll give it to anyone I want to. So you better shape up because right now I'm taking it away from you. It says in verse number 33, the same hour was the thing fulfilled upon Nebuchadnezzar. And he was driven from men and did eat grass as oxen. And his body was wet with the dew of heaven till his hairs were grown like eagle's feathers and his nails like bird's claws. And at the end of the days, I, Nebuchadnezzar, lifted up mine eyes unto heaven and mine understanding returned unto me and I blessed the most high. So here we have Nebuchadnezzar saying, these are his words. He's saying, this happened to me. He was just in the middle of saying how great he was. And then he hears this voice from heaven rebuking him and telling them, here's what's going to happen to you. And then finally, at the end of the seven years, finally, he's, he comes back to his senses. Because this whole time, he's just, he doesn't even know why. He's just out in the, in, the, in the environment, out eating grass, just everything about him starting to turn into like, like you know, his hair is getting so matted and everything, and all screwed up because he's not bathing, he's not taking care of himself. He's like an animal. His nails are just growing real long. He's not keeping up with himself. And then finally, it just comes to his senses after the end of the seven years that God said. And, and he, what's the first thing he says? He says, And I praised and honored him that liveth forever, whose dominion is an everlasting dominion, and his kingdom is from generation to generation. He got right. <laughs> See, we don't want to have to go through that in order to get right with God. Anything even close to that. God's proven a point here. Who is all-powerful? Who is almighty? Was it Nebuchadnezzar that did all that? No, it's God. And you know, even on a much smaller scale, we ought to be thankful and give thanks to God, the almighty God, for giving us everything that we need. Our daily provision, our daily bread, everything that we have. We need to be given respect and honor unto God. He's making it possible. He's the one who holds the, our breath in his hand. Every day, be thankful for the day that you have. And, and don't go getting yourself lifted up with pride and being boastful and, and, and allowing yourself to think that you are responsible for everything that you've done. Look, give God, give the Almighty One the credit and the glory and the honor due unto Him. Verse 35, And all the inhabitants of the earth are reputed as nothing, and he doeth according to his will in the army of heaven and among the inhabitants of the earth. And none can stay his hand or say unto him, What doest thou? No one can say that to God. Why? Because he's almighty and all-powerful. Daniel chapter 2, 
Verse 20, the Bible reads, And Daniel answered and said, Blessed be the name of God forever and ever, for wisdom and might are his. This is when the king Nebuchadnezzar had a dream, and he was saying that, Okay, I don't remember the dream anymore, and if you guys can't tell me what the dream was and what it means, I'm just going to kill you all. That was, that's what he was demanding. And Daniel is able to interpret to him, and he says, hey, you know what? Wisdom and might belong to God. God knows all things, and God has might. It says, and he changeth the times and the seasons. He removeth kings and setteth up kings. He giveth wisdom unto the wise and knowledge to them that know understanding. God's able to remove kings. God is able to, to put people up, take them down. That's why we ought to be entreating God. The fact that God is all-powerful is very valuable for us. The fact that God is everywhere is very valuable to us. The fact that God is eternal is very valuable to us. Think about it. Through prayer, through communication with God, we don't have to worry about, well, where is God? He's right here. Where two or three are gathered together in my name, there am I in the midst. It's easy to get a hold of God because He's everywhere. We can't turn away from him. We can't run from him. He is everywhere. It's easy to get a hold of him. He's not far from any one of us. And God is all-powerful. All-powerful. You have a problem in your life. You've got something going wrong. You think that, man, there is no solution out of this. Yes, there is. Just have some faith. Because anything that you think is impossible, all things are possible for God. Is anything too hard for the Lord? No. We serve an almighty God. What, what a reason to be comforted. What a reason to rejoice. How awesome is that? Jesus said, ask and you shall receive. Hey, let's go to God in faith. Let's bring our cares and our troubles and our trials unto God, who is all-powerful, who is a loving Father in heaven. And if you're a child of God, God will hear you. And, and God is there to help us and protect us, and He is capable of doing anything. So we have the comfort of knowing, no matter what the problem is, go to God. He's almighty. He's all powerful. Let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer. Dear Lord, we love you. We thank you so much for, um, for all that you are. And I pray that you would please help us as we continue to study these various characteristics and attributes that you have informed us about through your word. Lord, help us to gain wisdom and knowledge, to understand you better, to be able to communicate with you better, and be able to um, do what's going to be pleasing in your sight and, and not to be deceived by false teachings, Lord, but that we could just know more and understand more about you and what you would have from us. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.